Spain. Hello, adversaries. It's me again, Antonio D'Amico. This is Pointy Hat, and welcome to Tip of the Hat. That's right, this is a series where I give you D&D &D advice and give the video a controversial title so you click on it. But I have a good reason, I swear. Today, we're talking about a very unexplored, very obscure topic for D&D &D YouTube videos. That's right, it's time to talk about combat. Enough talk! I know, I know, this has been talked to death, but stick with me here. I think I have something new to bring to the table. And yes, I had to give it the attention-grabbing title. As I said, this has been talked about a lot, but I really think what I have to say is different from basically all advice I've seen on the matter. Let's talk a bit about the place of combat in the game. So people that snidely call D&D the dragon game often characterize it as a combat simulator. I guess in an effort to pretend that the thousands of people that put a lot of emphasis on roleplay and storytelling using D&D are all dumb, for doing so, because the ID can only do combat correctly. Can you tell I hate this take? Anyway, there is a kernel of truth to this mischaracterization. Combat is the most robust rule set out of all the rule sets in D&D. There are more rules about combat than about anything else in the game. Now, some people, and by some people I mean me, might say that D&D has plenty of rules and ways to deal with roleplay, and that the reason why there are so many rules for combat is that D&D takes a rules-light approach to roleplay and a rules-heavy approach to combat, and that can be very conducive to tell plenty of roleplay-heavy stories. I, for one, am glad that D&D doesn't have affection points or relationship states or whatever to mathematically track if an NPC likes you or not, except when it does. Stop that. D&D's combat system is deep because it wants to give players a deep combat experience. I really, really resent the implication that deep combat somehow means no story or no roleplay. But anyway, enough soapboxing. D&D has a complex combat system to allow for complex, deep fights. So why does it often end up being... A bit boring? Let's get into that. But before we get into combat proper, we gotta set up the world where it takes place. And what better way to do that than with a story? Our heroes have been traveling for weeks beneath hundreds of feet of solid stone. They've heard tales of an artifact that lies deep in the bowels of the earth. Some say ancient elves grew it like a plant by watering it with magic from the realm of the Fae. Some say that the first dwarves that walked under the surface forged it in flames at the core of the planet. And some say that the artifact is divine in nature. No matter the origin, the truth of the current situation is that after a long, arduous journey, the party stands before the object they've endured so many hardships to find. The World Anvil, an object capable of creating everything and anything. Now our heroes can bring to life anything they could ever think of. Animals, people, towns, nations, continents, entire worlds. But how would they possibly keep track of all of that? How would they organize it all? And in a convenient way? Well, that's exactly what World Anvil is for, and you can access this power yourself! That's right, you don't have to journey to the abyssal depths to find it. World Anvil is accessible to you from the comfort of your own computer. And this bad boy can do... Well, everything ever related to world building. World Anvil is an incredible tool that helps you create your world. From character profiles to information about entire nations, continents, and worlds. Everything is organized neatly and accessible for you to consult and keep track of with just one click. You can use World Anvil to flesh out your campaign world, keeping everything organized for extreme ease of reference for you or your players, or you can use it to plan out your novel and the world it takes place in. It has a manuscript feature that is literally built for novel writing. Sorry to say, you've run out of excuses to put pen to paper on that story that has been bouncing inside of your skull for years. And all of these options are offered with tools that help you world build easily and step by step if you so choose. So if this all sounds like something you would like to check out, go ahead and head down to the description of this very video and check out World Anvil. And now that we have a world to fight on, let's get back to combat and why it can feel flat in D&D. There's no one reason for combat to feel boring, as the 1000 videos on the topic clearly point out. So let's be clear, I'm not going to spend the rest of this video telling you to make your terrain interesting, or make sure your enemies move and keep the fight dynamic, or make your fights relevant to the story, or cater to your players' abilities instead of actively nerfing them. Plenty of creators have made great videos on all of those, and I'm just gonna link a bunch in the description. Check those out later if you haven't, they are all good. No. I'm gonna concentrate on something that I've seen people talk about in passing, but I've never seen someone 
really go into detail for. And I think this one thing makes such a difference as to how combat feels and adds a ton of variety and interest to your fight. And that's a combat's goal. Any hole is a goal. <laughs> What's the goal of a fight? No, I'm not talking about the story reason behind the fight. It's great that you're fighting so that you can prove to your fighter's hard-ass mom that he's ready to go on adventures, but that's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about what the win state is. What do the players have to do to win this fight? If this question sounds dumb to you, you are exactly the person this video is for. Me? Most DMs run combat with one win state and one win state only. The players win when the enemies are unconscious or dead, and the players lose if they are unconscious or dead. Before I say anything more than that, I wanna make one thing clear. This is fine. This is fine. This is perfectly fine. Most fights I run are exactly like this. This is not a sin. You have not been doing something wrong all this time. This is not me pulling the rug out from under you to tell you about how you should be running D&D in the pacifist run or else you're bad at the game. But the fact that most DMs never ever vary the goals of their combat is what to me makes so many fights feel so similar and frankly a bit boring. I think this is more common now than it was before because most new DMs today have more history with video games than with TTRPGs. And that that's, once again, perfectly fine. I love video games, I make them for a living, I am also in this camp, but it's extremely common for video games to have this exact same problem, where every fight is about killing the thing in front of you. In the past, DMs were more likely to add fights that were about, well, escaping from an enemy you could not defeat, but I also find that, well, not particularly inspired either. Like, it's good to add variety sometimes if you make it explicitly clear to your players that the thing they have in front of them will absolutely wipe the floor with them and escaping is the best and frankly the only option. God knows there are plenty of horror stories out there that go something like, my dumb players TPK themselves because they did not run from a fight that was too hard for them to win. Where the dumb players in question could not possibly have known that you randomly decided to put a demigod in front of them that would destroy them in two turns. You're not punishing your players for wrong decisions, you're a middle manager on a power trip. I think we can do much better than, actually guys, this fight is about running away. Varying the goal of a fight not only brings variety and breaks the monotony of putting a whole bunch of rooms full of dudes for your players to bunk to death, it also shifts how players fight and engage with the combat system they are so familiar with in a completely different way. I know this whole thing sounds like a lot of talk, but I mean it. This really does change everything. So how do we do that? How do we make fights more engaging and add variety by changing the goal of the fight? Well, that's the problem I found with most advice around this. It often ends there, with the person giving the advice saying something like, what if players have to flip a switch in the middle of the fight? And then it's up to you to come up with options other than flip the switch. The issue there is that I think it can be quite complicated to come up with options other than, hey guys, in this fight, you gotta flip a switch and then kill the guy. Now, I'm a fan of flipping switches. I flip switches all the time. I turn the lights on and off like nobody's business, but I think I can come up with something a bit more engaging than that. And that's why you pay me. Wait, what? What do you mean they don't pay me? What? Now, before I get into some options of different goals for your fight, it's time for my favorite part. Disclaimer portion. Listen up, those of you that love to argue a point I did not make during the video. I am NOT saying every fight should be like this. As I've said before, most of the fights I run have a bunk everything until unconsciousness as a goal. This is a great way to add variety to your fights. The point is not to constantly switch it up on your players, but to bring in these fights with different goals to break up the monotony. Also, you are more than welcome to use these several times. Hell, you can make a whole ongoing side quest out of some of them. Let players become better at a completely different type of combat throughout the adventure. Good? Good. Okay, let's go. Here are my options for goal shifts to spice up your combat. For our first goal shift, I'm gonna go easy by showing you how making an extremely small change can completely shift the strategy and goal of a battle. Change the target. The winner of the fight is the first party that brings something to zero hit points. Not the first one that brings everyone else to zero hit points, but the first team that brings one specific target in the enemy team down. Seems like nothing, right? Well, by making this extremely small change, you've just altered the entire dynamic of the fight. Spells like Warding Bond are no longer just out of combat extremely situational spells, but rather extremely useful staples of this type of combat. Fighting styles like the Protection style, that were up until now just useful for tanks and only used reactively, are now extremely useful picks for anybody that can use a fighting style. Half and three quarter cover granted by allies suddenly matters now, so does positioning, so does the difference between being a range 
combatant and a melee fighter, all of those change now that you've changed the goal. Do you take the time to bring down the tank or do you try to find a way to reposition them away from whoever they are defending? Do you first go for the healer who is pumping the target full of healing or the wizard who is teleporting the target away from your melee fighters? And while you're doing all of that, what are you doing to defend your target from the enemy? Are you going to set specific people as defenders? Now you're thinking of all of those questions instead of the usual hit stuff real good. Do you see how much of a change that makes? I didn't see so many story reasons for this fight to go like this. Maybe this is a sort of sport that a culture in your game plays. Maybe this is a competition. Maybe you're both trying to bring down the avatar of magic that is helping your side in a conflict. Think creatively. But how do you set this up? Well, a simple way to do this is to mosey on over to the ranger class. See, this even makes it so that the rangers are useful for something. And make an NPC with the stats of the Beastmaster Ranger's animal companion. Now your party is participating in this strange sport where the goal is to destroy the enemy's construct companion while protecting their own. Or literally any other explanation. Hell, give every party member a companion and make it so that the winner is the first team to eliminate three enemy companions if you want the fight to last longer. Or if you don't want to make it fair, Maybe make it so that the party has to flee while their enemies are targeting this companion they've stolen, and they have to both run and defend their companion from the enemy assault. This can be as versatile as you want it to be. But speaking of running away, what if we use that? For my second goal shift, we are literally gonna make the party try to reach a goal. That's right, what about actual racing? Make an extremely long battle map, as long as you can make it, and you're basically set. The goal of the PCs is to reach the finish line before the rival team. If you don't see how much this can change everything about battle, you have not been paying attention. By making the goal not defeating all opponents, but rather reaching a goal before anyone else, you've now changed absolutely everything about how this fight will go down. Does your party use their whole action to run, or is it better to cast some spells to disadvantage the rival team? Now suddenly, difficult terrains matters a lot for once. Spells like Expeditious Retreat matter all of a sudden too. Ditto for Kinetic Jaunt. Haste is less about the number of actions and more about the extra movement. Martial characters maybe want to action search so they can both move twice and trip someone making them prone. Making someone prone is suddenly this huge deal not because of advantage on attacks for half a turn, but because it caused that person have their movement just to get up. Same goes for grappling. And I can already imagine how you can add even more variety to this. If you make it so that the party is on top of a cart and the cart is what needs to cross the finish line first, it frees the party up for all sorts of shenanigans against the enemy cart, while stopping them from doing some sort of weird tabaxi monk Sonic the Hedgehog 400 feet of speed per turn weirdness. You can even make this competitive and ongoing by having it as a side quest that your party can take part in, making a whole bunch of races that the party can visit to win medals at each of them and become top racers. And before you know it, you're playing Tokyo Drift, D&D version, Mario Kart Edition, and everybody agrees you're the best DM known to man. Now pass my Okay, for our third goal shift, what if we took normal combat and changed the rules around it? What if it was more like wrestling? What if it was more about giving a show rather than winning fairly? What if we embraced the whole fake side of wrestling and turned it into its own game? To do this, let's give each type of action style points and make the goal to accrue the most style points before a certain number of rounds is up. Grappling might not be the best tactical option to win the fight, but it might give you a ton of style points to grapple someone and for your teammate to attack the enemy while they are grappled. Better yet, make it so that if the party does not put up a show, they lose style points. Using the same action two turns in a row bores the audience, so points are deducted. Not using your movement in combat makes the fight boring and static, so points are deducted. Using two spells of the same school of magic in a row is boring, so points are deducted. You could even make it so that they have to fight in character. The cleric has made up a persona about being an evil necromancer heal. Give extra style points if they pretend they are bringing someone back from the dead when they cast cure wounds on an unconscious ally. You can go the extra mile and make actions like taunt or rally the crowd. Actions that add absolutely nothing to the fight, but give you tons of style points. At the end, style points are tallied along with maybe the remaining HP and the winner is decided. You can even forgo the whole, the fight is over after a certain number of rounds, and turn it into a real fight that is only over when all members of a team are unconscious, and now it's about getting as many style points as possible and winning the fight. Do you want to make quick work of your enemies? That might actually make you lose style points as you rob the audience of a cool fight. But if you spend too much time getting style points, you might actually lose out on winning the fight part of the fight. 
this is also the perfect opportunity for your players to take the scribing duties from you and tell you exactly how their moves in combat look. You can even award extra style points for particularly cool descriptions. I can see many shy players finally going out of their shell with a setup like this. Okay, let's tally up. So far, we've got changing the target, running an actual race, and making it a style battle with style points added to traditional moves. But what if we took it a step further? What if we played with something even more different from D&D combat, all while keeping its rules intact? For our fourth and last goal shift, we're going to a frankly obvious source of inspiration. Sports. I know, I know, I know. I know this is a nerd safe space and like 87% of you have not cared about sports a day in your life. I'm right there with you, but stay with me a minute. Think about it. What better way to shift the goal of a battle than, well, with sports? Sports have goals, I've been told. See, right there. Th those are goals. So how should we go about it? What if the goal, no pun intended, of a battle was not to bunk everyone until they can't move anymore, but instead to score the most points? Kind of similar to the last idea with the style points, but with a more obvious system. If the ball enters the goal, that's a point. Simple and clean. It's the way that you're making me. <clears throat> anyway, let's base it on football, since that's the sport I'm most familiar with, but make it so that the players can touch the ball with their hands. <laughs> that... Sounded like something else. Anyway. And let's alienate my predominantly American audience by refusing to call it soccer. In order for this to work, we have to add some actions like shooting and passes, and some cool reactions like interceptions and lunges for positioning. Dex-based PCs will be better at setting up for passes and controlling the field, whereas strength-based PCs will be better at actually scoring goals. It will require some quite advanced teamwork at the table. Dare I say, much more advanced than most combat strategies in normal combat. Look at that! Now we have a DD challenge that doesn't unfairly favor spellcasters. We did it, we found the white whale of D&D design. But hear me out, what if we add our normal D&D combat system to all of this? Suddenly, it's not just about passes and shooting, but you can also bonk your opponents to death if you so choose. That opens the entire spectrum of spell and combat moves along with the sports angle. And your players have to decide if it's better to set up for a pass, try to shoot, or attack a particularly annoying rival team member. Spellcasters that are not good at either strength nor decks become battlefield controllers. Once again, spells that see little to no use in normal combat suddenly become extremely important, and range attacks and spells see even more use. Spellcasters won't get to make tactical passes or score goals, but they will help their team through clever spell usage. Doing these sort of hybrid systems of traditional combat rules and completely new rule sets that alter the goal of the game is really, really fun, because veteran players are already very familiar with their combat abilities, and adding a new system of rules to play around with shifts how they play and what abilities it's smart for them to use. I've seen players completely shift their spell list when faced with challenges like this and remark on how some spells they have literally never used before become extremely powerful with these new rule sets. Of course, this also accomplishes what we set out to do by completely shifting the goal of combat. Yes, downing enemies is a good tactic sometimes, but if the players spend their time only attacking the enemy team while the enemy team is free to score goal after goal, the player Players are just not gonna win, no matter how many people they bonk to death. So, yep, gotta do that. These extra rule sets are a bunch of work, I hope you're up for it. I mean, especially this last one. The others you can implement with not too much work, which is why I proposed them, but the sport one requires its own set of brand new rules with actions, reactions, rules for how to score, it's, it's a lot. Hope you're up for it, let me know how it goes. Oh, what's that? You don't feel like doing it? Well, let me tell you something. It's a good thing I did it for you! That's right, the entire rule set to play a sports match in D&D is in the description of this very video for... You guessed it, for free. Yep, 100% certified free. So go out there, put on some distracting gray sweatpants or yoga pants, and make your D&D combat a completely new experience. Game, set, and match to... Contest, Roger Me! I did it! I did the combat video. I've run this little system before with my players and we've had an absolute blast. Just really, really solid fun. And I've been doing this goal shift combat session for a long time. To frankly amazing results, I really hope you try it because it's been amazing at my table. Not just the sports one, of course, but the changing of the target, the race, the style points one, and any that you can come up with. Please forgive the title, you gotta play the YouTube game. And when you play the game of tubes, you win or you... Thank your engagement. <laughs> and speaking of, thank you to everybody that engages. If you like this little video and feel like <coughs> gauging further, go ahead. <laughs>
Share it around. Tell your friends. Tell your grocery store clerk. Tell your dentist. Shout about it on Reddit, on Tumblr, on Gaia Online. I'm too scared to do all of those for my own videos. And whenever I spy my stuff on Reddit, I'm like, oh, someone liked it enough to put it there. And it makes me happy. And I think that's nice. In any case, thank you if you do that. Thank you if you comment. I swear, I still read the comments. I think I read all of them or most of them. They are getting to a point where like, I think it's like 4K per video. So it's getting hard, but... I do read them, so y'all better be nice down there or I'll cry. In the last video, I wondered aloud if anyone stayed for my ramblings at the end, and it turns out that a whole bunch of you do, so thank you for that too. YouTube apparently cares a lot about how many people stay until the end, so thank you for doing that. If you've made it this far, share with the class a fight that you've been in or ran where the goal was different. I'm sure we can all find inspiration in what other people do to spice up their games. All right, gotta work on that Feywall video. It's it's coming very soon. I'm always scared to make promises, but it's looking very likely that we will be seeing that monstrosity of a video very, very soon. In the meantime, remember to stretch before engaging in physical activity, play fair, being competitive is perfectly fine, but remember not to be a sore loser. All right, enough advice. Okay, time for me to go to my video writing cave. Bye-bye now. Bye. Bye. Mwah.